1964, director Robert Stevenson and star Julie Andrews gave the world a charming little musical full of frivolity, silliness, and just generally wholesome fun. In 2020, we make a return trip to the Isle of Scotland. The film is Mary Poppins. The whiskey is Port Charlotte Tenure. And we'll review them both. This is the, the Film, film and, and Whiskey, whiskey Podcast. Podcast. Welcome to the Film and Whiskey Podcast, where each week we review a classic movie and a glass of whiskey. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And this week we are looking at the 1964 Walt Disney classic, Mary Poppins. I said you are the father of Jane and Michael Banks. Well, well yes, of course. I mean, uh, you brought your references, I presume. May I see them? Oh, I make it a point never to give references. A very old-fashioned idea to my mind. Is that so? We'll have to see about that then, won't we? Now, Brad, before we even get started today, I have to say up front, this is my wife's favorite movie, and she has been absolutely dreading us talking about this movie because it is not my favorite movie. And so for a long time, I've just been giving her such a hard time about what kind of score I'm going to give this film when we get around to it. I, I'm really interested to hear, Brad, what your history is with this film, Mary Poppins, because so many people grew up with this movie you know, as a part of their childhood, I don't really think it was a huge part of mine. I think it was one of those movies that was just way too long to hold my attention as a small child. Uh, But for some people, it really is like an integral part of their childhood. But where are you approaching this movie from, Brad? Honestly, Bob, I, I remember watching it once or twice as a kid. I have like vague memories of like really dirty men running around on a rooftop and them like riding uh, horses around and saying supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. But uh, other than that, I, I genuinely don't really have almost any memories of this movie. Um, even like now, I was I was just schnockered while watching it. So I barely remember the film. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, you know, if you've made it this far, you know that today's movie is Mary Poppins from 1964. There are a lot of different directions we could go with this movie, Brad. If you've seen the film Saving Mr. Banks from Walt Disney, you have at least some idea of the behind the scenes drama that unfolded with this movie. The Mary Poppins character was invented by the author P.L. Travers. Walt Disney had been trying to buy the rights to make this movie since the late 1930s. She had been saying no, 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 until she absolutely really could not say no anymore. Finally sold the rights off to Walt Disney, and he makes this musical masterpiece, which incidentally, the author of the children's books absolutely hated. <laughs> yeah, it, it never really... I mean, because why not? You know, like, it never really got any better for that relationship. Also of note, this is Julie Andrews' debut movie. This was the very first movie she ever made. Again, if we're going to talk about behind-the-scenes drama, she was very famous on Broadway. She had been in musicals like Camelot and My Fair Lady. When they brought the movie My Fair Lady to Warner Brothers to make the film, they did not bring Julie Andrews over with it. And so you know what they thought to themselves? Let's bring Audrey Hepburn in, who can't sing a note. Right. <laughs> and I do feel bad for Audrey Hepburn because she's great in that movie, but all of her oh, si- all of her singing was dubbed. But it became such a huge controversy about not casting Julie Andrews that they kind of pinned it on Audrey Hepburn. Like, oh, she didn't sing any of her own music. Well, I mean, that was a common practice in Hollywood. Like, if you watch West Side Story, Natalie Wood didn't sing any of her music, but no one cared about that. When it comes to Audrey Hepburn, they shut her out of the Oscars race. And they kind of all fawn over Julie Andrews in this movie. So she wins the Oscar for Best Actress for this film. And Audrey Hepburn doesn't even get nominated for My Fair Lady. So she does get the last laugh here. I'm interested to hear what you think of her performance overall in this movie, Brad. Do you think that she deserved an Oscar? Uh, Do you think that it was kind of just a makeup for what had been happening behind the scenes? But before we get into the, the nuts and bolts of all that, we have to take a step back and talk about what the heck this movie is about. And we do that with our favorite segment, Planet Earth's favorite segment, Brad Explains. This is where Brad breaks down the plot of the movie that he has just seen, often for the first time. And it sounds like we might as well consider this the first time you've watched it, Brad, since you didn't remember anything about it. 
So can you break down the plot of this movie for our listeners? You know, Bob, I'm not sure if I can, but uh, I'm going to try. I'm going to try really hard. I'm going to give it my best go college try and we'll see what happens because this movie, it doesn't really, how do I put this? Cohere? Uh, Yeah, it doesn't really make any sense (laughs) if I'm just being honest with myself. And I I will say my wife, conversely from, from Carrie, Haley despises musicals, like just hates them with almost every inch of her soul. You've mentioned this before. Yeah. Yeah, and and the reason that she gives now she's more okay with like Disney cartoon type musicals, but live action musicals drive her nuts and and her logic is that people never just break out in song. You know, like you're not just walking through your high school bummed about your day and like grab a basketball and start dribbling and singing a song with all your friends. Like that's just not what happens in normal life. And I've tried telling her, like, you know, like movies are a suspension of of reality and belief, and she's just not having Wait, it, bro. Are you, are you suggesting that Haley thinks that this is all real? Uh, she, she, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but I say all of this to say Mary Poppins is a movie where I'm kind of with Haley mm. on her argument, okay. like. And it's not necessarily because, like, you know, children don't sing and there's not weird, magical, you know, nannies that come out of nowhere. Like, I I get all that. But the movie just doesn't really make any sense. And there's not, like you said, there's not much coherence to the storytelling or why things happen or what's going on. It's just kind of like, hey, we're just going to kind of dance to dance and and we're going to step in time and we're going to say really long words and none of it really makes any sense. And then at the end, they get this weird moral about banks and money and evilness of capitalism. And I, I just, I don't get it. So uh, here's here's my best shot. The Banks family has two terrors of children who really aren't that bad. Like, they're pretty much just normal kids. But all these British nannies are like, they're not having it. And they keep quitting. And so they post the job. And Mr. Banks writes a letter about wanting this responsible uh, nanny that's going to raise them up in the proper British way. And the kids write a letter about how they want a nanny who's fun and kind and caring and and all this stuff. And the magic of Mary Poppins, you know, has her receive that letter and she blows away a bunch of other nannies and she shows up flying in on her broom. I mean, I mean, umbrella. And she saves the children from a dull and dreary existence. And she takes them into magical fantasy acid PCP. I mean, you know, just (laughs) magical lands. And she hangs out with this dirty, kind of gross Dick Van Dyke character who's a broom sweep or a chimney sweep. And they they hang out. And there's like a weird sexual tension between Poppins and Bert. Yeah, there is. And I I just, I don't know what's going on in this movie, Bob. But in the end, there's a cannon that fires on the house next to them and wakes everybody up. And that's all that really matters. And Mr. Banks loses his job because his kid won't give the old miserly bank owner two pence. So, yeah, that's about it. But then at the end, Mr. Banks is all good with it. He's like, yeah, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. (laughs) So, Brad, I want to jump in like right away off of what you're what you're talking about here, because I don't know if you'll remember this, but when we watched The Sound of Music, we both kind of had suggestions for how to make that movie tighter and how to make it a better film. And the tension that I felt with that movie was that all of the really memorable musical moments were actually really inessential to the plot. And that there's this tension of like, if we're going to cut this movie down, do you want to cut out? planet earth's favorite songs ever in a musical or do you want to cut out actually important plot stuff because you know the second half of that movie where the actual nazis come into power and stuff that's where the story actually starts occurring and you know act one is really just dragging out this really kind of idyllic life at the von trapp family home i feel like this movie is almost a carbon copy of that in some ways because It has some of the best songs that were ever written for a Walt Disney musical. I mean, just truly, absolutely great songs. However, this is this movie is just too long. And if you have to cut something, what you're forced to choose between is cutting the actual story, the actual plot line, 
which doesn't really come into focus until the last, I'd say, 30 minutes of the movie. This really is, at the end of the day, a movie about Mary Poppins teaching these kids and teaching their father that there are more important things in life. And you don't understand the purpose of the plot until that last 30-ish minutes where you have a fantastic scene with Bert and uh, and Mr. Banks where he's basically telling Mr. Banks, you're going to be too late to take care of your kids if you keep focusing on the wrong things. It's the best acted scene in the whole movie. It's an emotional scene. And then everything after that really kind of comes into focus. But the problem is you have two hours of movie on the front end of that that just kind of go wherever it wants to go. Although all of those songs are great, if you completely rearranged the order that any of those songs happen in, it doesn't affect the plot of the movie at all. Like the scene where they go into the oil painting. If you had put that where the step in time sequence is, it wouldn't have affected a darn thing about the movie. Like, there, there's just really no forward momentum to the movie. It's just more like a series of episodes that they continually go through. And then they're, like, checking their watches at the end of the movie. They're like, oh, I guess we have to get on with it and actually tell a story here. And they spend the last half hour doing that. If I'm being honest, I think the obvious thing to do would be to cut some of those songs out. But that's a really difficult position to take because the songs themselves are really good. They just serve no purpose to the film itself. Well, I, I think the answer isn't to cut those out. I think it's to actually write a story for the movie. Yeah. Like the difference between this and The Sound of Music is that with The Sound of Music, it feels like there's an actual storyline, an actual thread pulling through the entire movie about this young girl who's torn between choosing a life at the nunnery and choosing a life with this, you know, widower and his family. And that is that tension is present throughout the entire movie with this one. Like you said, Bob, the tension doesn't enter until about an hour and 45, two hours into the movie. At, at that point, you're like bought into the nothingness of the movie and you're kind of like, oh, this movie isn't about anything. And so when they try to shove something in at the end, it just feels like like a, a poor man's excuse for a storyline in the movie and there's nothing of substance there uh, until you get to that scene with Dick Van Dyke and David Tomlinson. So it, it's just, yeah, it's it's just not great. Well, and, and I and will say, I'm I'm curious, Bob. I am I I am sure in my heart that you and Carrie have had this argument many times. So give us Carrie's side of you know what what would she respond to everything we just said about this movie? Here's the thing: I I don't actually know where she would fall on what I just said, because this is such a this is such a huge part of her childhood. It's such a huge part of her nostalgia. And that's why I say that it's difficult for me to even take that position, because, you know, what I'm advocating is essentially like, hey, pick one of your five favorite songs ever in a movie and just remove it for, for the sake of getting on with the plot. Right. And and I, I don't like to I don't like to say that. And I'm sure Carrie would say that that's a ridiculous argument to make. But at the end of the day, Brad, I think you're absolutely right in that it just doesn't have a story for a long time. And I think that the longer you go into the movie, Mary Poppins lessons that she's teaching the kids kind of make more sense. Like when she's teaching them about the, the bird lady and she sings feed the birds. That's a very tangible lesson about, you know, being able to see past the end of your nose. But what was the moral or what was the lesson involved in the 25 minute excursion into the oil painting? That was more just like, hey, let's go do something random. And Walt Disney's like, I'm going to flex my muscles and show you how Dick Van Dyke can interact with animated penguins. And like, it's it's really great to watch. And it's a huge entertainment value. But for me, when you watch four or five of those sequences in a row that really don't serve the plot and they kind of all go on too long, it becomes a little grating after a while. And, it, and it, it's kind of draining for me to get through this movie because you have so many of those sequences that when you don't know what purpose it serves in the movie, it really does limit how long I want to pay attention to it, if that makes sense. It does make sense. But I, I will say this does feel like one of those movies where they're just kind of pushing boundaries to push boundaries mm -hmm. and they're trying to learn how to integrate live action with animated. And 
So there is a part of me that's like this this movie is almost art house in certain ways of trying to push the envelope for what can be done in cinema. And so I, I think there's certain elements of they were like, you know what? We don't know what the story is, but we're just going to do some cool stuff. And and I applaud them for that. But it's not necessarily a movie I want to come back to time after time. Yeah, yeah, I totally get that. Brad, before we go to break, we should just kind of get out of the way the basic things we talk about usually in our first half. And that usually includes the performances. So let's just kind of go top to bottom here. I know that it it sounds like you have an issue with Mary Poppins, the character. But when it comes to Julie Andrews portraying her, what did you think of Julie Andrews performance in this film? Oh, stunning. Uh, I mean, her performance this really might be one of the best debut performances of oh, all for time. Sure. She takes utter command of this character and is literally the most perfect nanny that you could ever imagine. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and even beyond the magical side of it, the way that she she cares for the children, the way that she is stern when need be, loving when necessary. Like, she just has a presence about her in this movie that you can tell comes from years and years of practice on the stage. Just as I thought, extremely stubborn and suspicious. <laughs> I am not. See for yourself. <laughs> extremely stubborn and sus- suspicious. <laughs> now you, Jane. Hmm, rather inclined to giggle doesn't put things away. <laughs> How about you? Very well, hold this for me. As I expected, Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way. I mean, she is just really amazing in this film. Absolutely. Yeah, I I mean, I don't really have anything to add to that, Brad. She's she's incredible. And I don't think that we are, like, revolutionizing anything by saying that she's incredible in this movie. And I'm with you, Brad, in that I do have issues with Mary Poppins as a character. I can't always understand exactly what her motivations are. Why she exists. Yeah. Like, what what I, is she? Like, is she, is she magic? Yeah. Is she an angel? Like, what, what exactly is she? But beyond all that, Julie Andrews plays her just pitch perfect. And Whatever she is, she does a great job. And on the other side of things, you've got Dick Van Dyke playing Bert. And it is no secret that it... There have been copious pages <laughs> written about Dick Van Dyke's performance in this movie because it has to be said he has the worst Cockney accent in the history of film. It, I mean, it's just it's awful. And and he goes in and out of it every single line. He goes from being an American to being Irish to being Scottish to being Cockney in the span of like two sentences. However, but however, in the middle of but in the middle of that, he's one of the most charming he's fantastic, human beings. Right? Yeah. Ever. I mean, like, yeah. And the funny thing is, like, I, I was watching some interviews that he was giving on this movie, and I just assumed that he kind of came, you know, was cut from the same cloth as some of these other performers that were in 1950s, 1960s film, that he would have a back an almost vaudevillian kind of background. And he didn't at all. He said he wasn't a dancer at all before this movie. And I watch him do these really elaborate, intricate dances in this film. I would never have thought that. Obviously, he was very famous on television. He had done Bye Bye Birdie, both on Broadway and the film version. So he was accustomed to doing some dancing, but like he wasn't known for being that sort of triple threat person. And I think that he absolutely steals the show in almost every scene that he's in despite his horrific accent like (laughs) and again it has to be said really bad can you tell me how you feel about his accent brad i mean come on dude you gotta at least admit that that was it was really really bad (laughs) it was real bad (laughs) i just remember he he comes on screen and a you're kind of thrown off by like why is he hanging out with mary poppins and b why is an american trying to fake being British and hang out with Mary Poppins and these two British children. It it just didn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean, and and the funny thing is he plays multiple roles in this movie, right? He also plays the old man Dawes at the bank and he does a pretty respectable old British man voice. Yeah. So at some point, why didn't they just say, hey, Bert doesn't need to be Cockney. He can just be some other form of British. And let's just lean into that because it sounded like he could do an okay generic English accent. 
generic English male seven. <laughs> <laughs> but I, it wouldn't be as much fun if he didn't talk like this. <laughs> Oh, Brad, this gives me an opportunity to talk about my favorite person in the whole movie, and that is David Tomlinson as Mr. Banks. Carrie, Carrie hates that I love him so much in this movie because <laughs> because he is like he can't see past the end of his nose. There's an element of him being bumbling, but for the most part, it's not bumbling. It's just oblivious to the things happening around him. I love the little song they write for him when he's first introduced and he comes home and he's talking about how, you know. My my sherry slippers and pipe are due at 602. How lordly is the life I lead? You know, he's going to pat his kids on the head and send them off to bed. And he lives such a wonderful life. It's it's it makes me laugh so hard. It, like when the kids come down to breakfast the one morning and they're singing supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. And he goes like, what, 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 you know, what in the blazes are you talking about? And the kids are like, it's what you say when you don't know what to say. He's just like, yes, well, I always know what to say. I, I yeah. just I laugh so hard. He is so funny. And then when you get to that pivotal scene between Dick Van Dyke and him, he really takes over the movie for the last 20 minutes. And he provides this movie with the emotional core that it was lacking. I mean, it really does become a story about him and his redemption and how Mary Poppins has positioned you know, herself to redeem him and, and solidify this family unit again. I just think that he knocks it out of the park in this movie. I thought you were going to say the way that she possessed him because <laughs> she a very might movie. be she might be a demon. I'm not sure. <laughs> I I will say, Bob, I love, love Mr. Banks in this film for all the reasons that you said. I am very confused by his wife's character, though. Yeah, like, I've never is understood. She a, is she a suffragette? Is she just like a doting wife? Is she a good mom or a terrible mom? I, I don't really know. She's very confusing to me. I think that they kind of have to make her character absent to make Mary Poppins make sense. And the way that they get her to be absent doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't think either one of us would have a problem with her being a suffragette, right? Like that's a, that's a really noble thing to be fighting for. But then when it comes to like, oh, I'm going to go downtown so we can throw tomatoes at, at the prime minister. Can't somebody watch my kids? <laughs> and, then, and then she's like, you, chimney sweep, you can watch my kids. And I'm like, yeah, uh, just, like you know. they, they really are stretching this to find a way to get her to not be around. It, it, it doesn't and, and really she, make a lot of sense. And the, the way she uses her voice is just kind of grating. Like it's it's kind of that fake, sickly, sweet. Don't know what you're talking about, but I want you to stop because well, your, and I your also, voice is like fake. I also have to say one of the things with this movie that I've never really appreciated is that in a lot of ways, the movie looks kind of cheap and it's not a cheaply made movie. Like it definitely cost a lot of money to make. But every time they're inside the bank's home, the lighting is so harsh, like nobody's home is actually lit like that. And you can really tell when they do close ups of Mrs. Banks. And this is not in any way a reflection on her looks or anything like that. But but when you're in a Hollywood movie, generally what they try to do is light you in the most flattering way possible. And it looks like they have her backed up against like an, a white wall with a spotlight on her face. It's just like it, it, you notice it with the close ups with Bert. You notice it with the close ups with Mrs. Banks. Sometimes it just seems very, very obvious that a. This is a set and not a real home. And B, it just seems like they overlit and overexposed so much of what they were doing on camera. And I, I know that's like a really minute thing for me to get into, but it really pulled me out of the movie to see sometimes how cheap everything on screen looked. I don't know if you had that issue, Brad, but bringing up Mrs. Banks reminded me of that. Oh, no. I Yeah, that that was very, very rough. Her, her character in general, I don't know if she was filmed well or written well. I, I probably struggled with her more than anyone else. Hmm. All right. Well, Brad, we have a lot more that we could be talking about here. I think we, we can get into some of the more minor roles if you'd like. But I do think that before we get any further, we need to hit pause. We need to try this Port Charlotte. What do you say? I do have a joke for you, Bob. <laughs> Is it about a wooden a man with a wooden leg named Smith? It sure is. <laughs> what was the name of his other leg? <laughs> uh, just first of all, just a fantastic joke. Oh, it's I mean, spectacular! Just a perfectly well written joke. It's so funny, and when they <laughs> reprise it at the end with the with the old banker. Oh man! All right, let's drink this whiskey, Bob.
right. So today we are drinking Port Charlotte heavily peated single malt scotch whiskey. This comes from the Brooklotic distillery. We haven't had anything from Brooklotic before. Uh, if you know anything about Brooklotic, their namesake line, and then they also make a line of whiskey called Port Charlotte, and they make another line of whiskey called Octomore. This is a distillery that's been around since the 1800s. It's it, it's really well established. Uh, Isla Scotch. In the early 2000s, they got bought by a new corporation, and they really reinvigorated the brand especially by launching these two other expressions of whiskey from inside the distillery. So today we are checking out the Port Charlotte. And before we get too far into it, Bob, I do want to give a big shout out to our Discord follower, Asian Elvis, for buying us this Port Charlotte whiskey. Thanks oh, so yeah, much, absolutely. man. Yeah, thank you. So, Brad, I don't always do great with heavily peated whiskeys. We've only had a few on the podcast. Uh, the Laphroaig Tenure, I did not like. The Laphroaig Lore, I really, really liked. Where are you falling with uh, with your peated whiskeys? Honestly, Bob, I I have found myself enjoying peated whiskeys. Uh, they they have a certain I don't know, just this like meaty essence that just is awesome. And it's not always good, but it's always like trying to knock the ball out of the park. And I think I can appreciate that. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I, it, it feels like there's a very thin line between a heavily peated scotch being great and being terrible. And so I think that whenever you look at scotch, you're you're really trying to figure out where does it fall in the category of greatness or mehness. Yeah, and I think that has to do with a lot of the notes that surround the peat on the palate and on the nose. Sometimes we get just I mean it smells like a recently extinguished fire surrounded by cheap beef jerky and, and those are not for me. But there's other times where you get those great butterscotchy vanilla notes. And I think that the peat can really enhance some of the sweetness in some of these whiskeys. That's why I liked the Laphroaig lore so much. So I'm excited to get into this, Brad. Let's give this a nose. Now that, my friend, is a heavily peated scotch. <laughs> you know, the funny thing, though, is that it still isn't as offensively strong on the peat and the smoke as the Laphroaig 10 was. I don't think we'll ever have one that is that in your face with the peat. This one is very smoky, but I think it falls kind of in between those two extremes that I just mentioned in terms of like the uh, the dried meats on one side and the butterscotch on the other. It's a little bit softer. I wouldn't say that it smells sweet in any way, but it also doesn't really lean into the, the more like saline heavy elements. No, the iodine isn't like crazy strong on this. There's a little bit of fruitiness that's like really softly present. But you're right. It's just a really nice, inoffensive, peated nose that it's not going to blow you out of the water and, and kind of make you fearful about what's to come. Overall, it's really, really pleasant. I'm going to give it an eight out of 10 on the nose. Yeah, I'm going to give it a six and a half on the nose because it does like like we're both saying it falls so in the middle of that spectrum that I don't feel like it really has a lot of distinguishing characteristics to it aside from the peat and the smoke. That's really all I'm picking up on this. It it does have a, a little bit of a sherry kind of note that you might get with some non-peated scotches, but there's just really not a lot here. So I'm just going to give it a six and a half and hope that we pick up more on the taste. So Brad, let's give it a sip. Oh, Bob. That is really good. This is a good dinner time whiskey, Brad. Holy cow. This is not the kind of whiskey, uh, for those of you who are listening, uh, we're recording this at 8.55 in the morning. So first of all, this is really weird to just be drinking this early in the morning. But this is a whiskey that is perfect for an evening by the fireside or, you know, just after you've gotten done eating a steak somewhere. This reminds me a lot of uh, Lagavulin 16. It definitely leans more into like the medicinal, I think, on the the flavor than anything else, Brad. It's It's not bitter. But it's also not meaty, it's not fruity, it's darker and less sweet than I expected it to be. And I do think that the note that I would that I would give predominantly on this would be like medicinal. I don't I don't know, Bob. I, I do not get that strong of a flavor of that like heavily herbed almost like I guess when I hear you say medicinal like that, it makes me think about like bitters. Mm. And and for me, it doesn't have that much of a flavor. I actually feel like it's a little bit lighter. There's a little bit of honey on the tip of your tongue right as you taste it. And as it sits on your palate, 
it develops into some floral notes. Uh, there's a little bit of citrusy kind of feel to it. I am really, really impressed with this whiskey. I'm going to give it a 9 out of 10 on flavor. Wow. Wow. Yeah, Brad, I know that you really do like your pita scotches. And for me, I think it really has to hit the right groove for, for it to click with me. But I respect this one. Again, I'm always going to throw Lafrog 10 under the bus. I just did not enjoy that whiskey. But this one, for having that sort of iodine medicinal note on the palate for me, I like it. I really do. I'm going to give it a seven and a half on the taste. And that takes us to finish. Now, this is a hundred proof whiskey, which you don't always see with scotch. You don't typically see them go above a hundred proof. Once in a blue moon, you'll find like a cask strength one. So this really is on the higher end of the alcohol spectrum with scotches. And I think it works really well. You get a nice wave of alcohol as soon as you swallow that kind of comes back up your tongue. You get a nice little hug on the way down. I think that that medicinal note that I picked up really plays nicely with the alcohol in this. And it doesn't really drink super hot, even though it's 100 proof. I think the alcohol really does complement everything here. Brad, what do you think of the finish? Honestly, it just sits beautifully on your palate. And then as it finishes, you just get an amazing bit of smoke. It's not overpowering. It, it gets a little bit more savory on the back end, uh, which I enjoy. It, it really is a complex whiskey. And for me, the finish is really, really good. Not quite as good as the palate. I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10 on the on the finish. Yeah, I think I'm going to split the difference between my taste and my palate, which was a 6.5 and a 7.5. And I'll just give this a 7 on the finish. It's pleasant, uh, but it's really nothing to write home about. All right, and that takes us to overall balance. This is where we talk about nose, taste, and finish all put together. Brad, even though this whiskey might not be in my wheelhouse... I still think it's a really well-balanced whiskey. I thought that the, the notes that you got on the nose were, were pretty predominantly there on the taste. Uh, even though it's not very sweet, it didn't really pretend to be sweet at any point for me. So I think this is a, a, a pretty solidly balanced whiskey. I, I'm struggling with what to give it because part of me wants to give it like an eight or an eight and a half on balance. Uh, I guess I'll give it an eight just to play it safe. Yeah, I'm going to give it an eight and a half on balance. I think that this is complex. It has a lot of different stuff going on for it, but it all works together well to give you a really great tasting scotch. So yeah, I'm going to give it an eight and a half on balance. And when it comes to price in the state of Ohio, you can get a bottle of Port Charlotte for $69.99. And for $70, I personally think that you're getting a really good scotch. Mm. There's a lot of flavor, a lot of complexity here. And when you take into account normal scotch prices, I really think that this is a well-made scotch that $70, you know, as in all scotches, it's always a little bit on the higher end of things. But I think for a scotch, it's pretty fairly priced. I'll give it an 8 out of 10 on, on value. Yeah, I think this is a little bit too high for, for my taste, Brad, because, again, the Lefroy 10 is $40. I actually really prefer Ardbeg 10 to this. Uh, Ardbeg is, I think, $50 in the state of Ohio. I know that uh, they, they definitely try to be a little more intensive in terms of having a, a bunch of their malt come from Isla. So I mean, maybe it's it's a little bit more well crafted than some of those other whiskeys, but it I don't think it should be in a completely different price category. And this one is uh, so I'm only going to give it a six out of ten on value just because I think there's other comparable whiskeys that cost less than this. And so I think, Brad, we're probably going to come out in, in pretty different places on this whiskey. I'm coming out to a thirty five out of fifty. Yeah, Bob, I once again, I, I feel like I just I really like these peated scotches. I'm coming out to a 41.5 out of 50. Uh, this is a one of the highest scored whiskeys for me. It's a high. It's on the higher end for you. I, I feel like this is one of the best whiskeys we've had this season. Yeah, I would definitely still choose the Lafroy lore over this, which is our highest scored whiskey of the whole season so far. Oh, well, that's not true. Booker's was our highest one. But uh, of scotches, I would still choose the Lefroy lore over this. Brad, do you think you would choose this one over Lefroy? I think I would. Wow. I, I think this one has a little bit of softness to it, that it, it's not overpowering. I, I just I really like this a lot. It's an impressive whiskey. Well, that's bringing us out to a 76 and a half out of 100 or an average of a 38.25. Again, I definitely fall on the lower end of that spectrum and Brad would probably reward it a few points more. Brad, would you recommend ultimately? 
100%. I would definitely encourage you, go find it, at, whether it's at a local whiskey bar or a bottle. It's well worth your time and money. Yeah, and again, the, the the further we get into this podcast, the more that I can just identify my wheelhouse. I am a bourbon drinker. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of peated scotches, and yet I would still say that this is a great example of a peated scotch. So I would also recommend, and I think this gives us some positive energy to carry into the back half of our episode on Mary Poppins. So, Brad, what do you say we get back into talking about that film? Let's get to it. All right, so that was Port Charlotte 10 Year, a whiskey that we both liked, and we're getting back into talking about a movie that we're both kind of iffy about, 1964's Mary Poppins. Brad, before we left for the break, we had talked about some of the actors in the film, really the main actors in the film, but the only ones that we haven't touched on are the two child actors. And to be quite honest, Brad, like I, I don't think there's anything to write home about with, bo- with either of their performances. They both kind of, <laughs> especially the, the daughter, I can't remember what her name is, Jane, I think. She she constantly looks like she has a blank expression on her face. She's really not showing a ton of emotion. But, you know, overall, I think the two child actors are serviceable in the roles that they're given. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, they're fine. Yeah, they they, they don't really add or detract from the movie. I feel like they're just kind of set pieces that, you know, Dick Van Dyke and Julie Andrews just kind of work around yes. and with. <laughs> like, that, that's like that's kind of how I feel about them. They're moving, talking set pieces. Well, especially in that extended sequence in the oil painting. By the time you get to supercalifragilistic and all that, the kids are like off sitting on top of a fence eating candy apples, yeah, and like they're not even there. You don't you don't even see them for probably five six minutes, and she's supposed to be you know supervising them, and she's taking them into a magical land and just completely loses track of them. So you know, good on yeah, you, Mary they're... Poppins. They're just kind of there. But <laughs> honestly, that kind of brings me to one of my main frustrations with this movie is I, I don't understand why other than like the magic, why anybody would want her as your nanny. Like like there's parts where she's charming and caring and stern and all those things. But like she's not very responsible at all. And she's kind of condescending to everybody. And I just struggle with the way her character was written. It just feels like. I don't know, like your story about Walt Disney wanting this story from the author so badly, it's almost like they decided to just make every single thing in the world of Mary Poppins revolve around Mary Poppins. And she just walks on air as if she's better than everyone else. And I just, I don't enjoy that as a character. Well, I think part of it too is that you're force fed this idea that she's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Like all of the lyrics in that one song, the Jolly Holiday song, are all about how she's just, she's the cream of the crop, the tip of the top, all that stuff. And you're being told that, but then in her actions, you don't necessarily see someone that would make you think that. It's just that you're so constantly told by all the characters, Mary Poppins is so great, that they expect you to just kind of be like, okay, sure, I believe you. But you're right, Brad, I think her MO, and again, you don't really realize this till the end of the film, is that she introduces the kids to this idea that there is more out there than than what's past the end of their noses. And she comes into these very fraught home situations and reconciles the parents with the children. And the way that she does that is by taking the kids on sort of a magical journey and then kind of denying that they ever had a magical experience. And I think that there's a lot of people who have noted that Technically, what she's doing is gaslighting them, which which is really problematic. <laughs> but but I understand why she does it, because she doesn't want the kids at the end of the day to think Mary Poppins is the solution here. Mary Poppins is the thing that's holding us all together so that when it's time for her to actually leave, when she has succeeded in reconciling the kids with the parents, it's almost like she wants to make it so that they completely forget that she was ever there. And 
it's not until you get to the end of the movie that you understand what she's doing and why she's doing that. And I guess that is one of my bigger frustrations with the film is that you don't quite know for a while why the kids are saying like, oh, Mary Poppins, didn't you have fun inside the oil painting? And she's going, what oil painting? I would never be in an oil painting. And she just like she really kind of emotionally tortures them for a while. And it just kind of makes me wonder, like, is the end result of what she was trying to achieve worth two hours of watching her treat these kids in very mixed signals? Do you know what I mean? Well, it feels like the writers of the movie didn't know what they wanted to do with, like, magic. They were kind of like, yeah, we're going to have magic in the world. But the thing about it is the people who do magic are going to say that they don't do magic. And mm-hmm. that's going to be, like, their thing. That's going to be what they do. And I, it just feels weird. Like, either be a kid's movie that is okay with the idea of magic where Tom Hanks is suddenly an adult and we're just okay with that. That's just a part of the world. Or don't have magic in the movie and just make her a really good nanny. But then I guess that would just be the sound of music. So <laughs> right. I, I, so I don't I don't know. It just feels like they were waffling between this whole magic is real versus it isn't real. And it creates a really confusing, weird, emotionally manipulative character. Well, Brad, before we get into our final scores, I do want to touch on this soundtrack, because like I said earlier, it is one of. It's one of the best soundtracks to a children's film I've ever heard. The songs are just incredible. They are all earworms. Walt Disney himself, his favorite song in the final years of his life was Feed the Birds. And that's a that's a song that's really near and dear to my own heart. I really get I'd get emotional when I hear that song. I think it's just a beautiful piece of music. Having kind of come back into this movie with years and years, you know, since you've seen it last, Brad, did the song stick out to you this time? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, there's certain songs like the Spoonful of Sugar that you're like, oh, yeah, it's Spoonful of Sugar. It helps, helps the medicine go down. I got it. Uh, and the the Chim Chimney, that that sticks yep. out to me. I, I really enjoyed the Fidelity Fiduciary Bank. I, that was just like a fun song. Um, and the really laughing, cleverly written, too. Oh, it's so cleverly written. The lyrics in that one are just spectacular. Um, I liked the the loving to laugh song. That was a lot of fun. So, yeah, overall, I would say this is really a great soundtrack that is lifted up by a incredibly lovable character in Dick Van Dyke and a spectacular talent in Julie Andrews. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And Brad, so this is where I'm coming down on this movie, because everything <laughs> that has gone out into the universe about this movie in the last 50 something years has said this is a great film and it is a classic film. When the movie came out, Brad, it was nominated for 13 Academy Awards. That is like, it, it, you know, I, I haven't checked it against the other films that came out that year. It obviously lost Best Picture uh, to My Fair Lady, but it was one of the most nominated films of all time at that point. 13 nominations. And I look at this movie now and I'm like, okay, I can see where some of it came from. I can see that, uh, you know, Julie Andrews obviously deserved that nomination and award. The songs deserve to be nominated. The special effects for the time. But like best picture, best cinematography, best art direction. Like I'm just I'm really surprised that this movie caught on the way it did. Uh, And I wonder sometimes if I'm just like an old stick in the mud because I don't seem to enjoy this quite as much as it seems the general population does. So, Brad, as I wrestle with my stance on this movie, I really want to hear where you're at with it. You kind of came into it with fresh eyes. I've probably watched this movie, I don't know, 10, 15 times just in the last year or two because we're showing it to my son all the time now. And so uh, I'm really struggling over here to to come down with a final score. But I want to hear what you thought of Mary Poppins this time around. Uh, You know, it's charming. It's fun. It's silly. There's a lot going for this movie. It's fine. I think that there are better musicals out there, which we've talked about one a lot already. My Fair Lady. Hmm. It's a spectacular musical. You know, West Side Story is a spectacular musical. There's just so many other examples of out of this world great musicals that I don't think this is one of them. It's it's fun. It's fine. I'm going to give it a seven and a half out of ten. Yeah. Yeah, Brad, for a long time, I even told my wife before I rewatched it, I said, here's where I'm at with it. I'm going to give it a six and a half. And she's like, oh, how could you? And then I sat down to watch it this time. And, and there's something about trying to be as objective as possible. 
I definitely enjoyed it more this time. I almost decided to give it an 8 out of 10. But I've watched it so many times and been so underwhelmed all those other times that I feel like I have to take those into account. And so I'm going to come out in the exact same place as you, Brad. I'm going to come out to a 7.5 out of 10. This is a worthwhile movie. I really enjoy parts of it. But again, it it suffers from that same thing that Sound of Music does, where the songs are not well integrated into the plot of the movie. And so you really have to choose between... Do you like the entertainment value of the songs or do you like when the movie actually has a story because they so rarely happen at the same time? And I really do think that's the fatal flaw of this film. And I think if you really want to watch a movie where the story and songs integrate well, go watch West Side Story. Oh, absolutely. Like that is a movie that perfectly captures this idea of a musical being an emotional expression of the lives of the characters in the movie. So so that that would be my suggestion. If you want a movie that really gets into a story and music, West Side Story is where it's at. But we want to know what you think. We're coming out to a seven and a half on average, but maybe we're too far off with our scores. So if you want to write into us and let us know what you think of Mary Poppins, you can find us on social media on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Film Whiskey. Or you can give us a phone call. Our phone number is 216-800-5923. Once again, it's 216-800-5923. Or leave us a voicemail on our website, which is anchor.fm slash filmwhiskey. Next week, we kick the Christmas season off in earnest with a film that is, in fact, a Christmas movie. The 1980s action classic, Die Hard. So join us for that next week for the Film and Whiskey Podcast. I'm Bob Book. I'm Brad G. And we'll see you next time. Film and Whiskey is produced, engineered, and edited by Bob Book and Brad G. And it's made possible from support from listeners like you. If you'd like to support the show, you can donate directly to us at our Anchor page, anchor.fm slash filmwhiskey, where you can support the show for as little as $1 a month. Or if you'd like some perks, donate to our Patreon page. You can find us on patreon.com slash filmwhiskey, where for as little as $3 a month, you'll receive benefits like membership to an exclusive Discord chat room, extended cuts of each episode, and early access to every film and whiskey episode. We want to say thank you again to our Patreon supporters, especially those sponsoring us at our highest viscosity level. And that includes our friends Corey Easterday, James Talbert, Austin Dupree, and Aperture Flash. We'll see you next week.